Welcome to the Biohacking Congress in Miami. I'm Stefan Spencer. We have Harris Khan with us. This is a fantastic conference here with over 30 speakers and 20 health companies exhibiting. We are uh, just yeah chatting about longevity. The DNA company is a really cutting edge company. We'll talk a little bit about, but we're going to talk about technology and health and science and how they intersect to get an extra long life for you. Mm -hmm. So Harris is a co-founder of the DNA company and uh, Harris, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for inviting me here and having us hosted here and, and conducting this interview. I'm very excited to talk to you about longevity. Yeah. So first of all, uh, what interested you in joining the or starting mm -hmm. the DNA company? Because there are a lot of DNA sequencing yeah. companies out there, what makes the DNA company special? Yeah, so I mean, my background uh, is in biomedical sciences, you know, your typical story, my parents wanted me to be a doctor and get into healthcare, and I realized very quickly that I was not made out to be a doctor. Um, so I decided to go down the route of industry and work in pharmaceuticals because I was very naive at the time. Uh, and although I was able to make, you know, a lot of, uh, I was able to help develop drugs that were billion dollar drugs at, the, at, at their infancy stage uh, in formulation development. I realized very quickly that the bureaucracy and the growth model there in pharmaceuticals simply didn't sit well with me. So I wanted to get more into, rather than helping sick people get healthy, I wanted to get into, well, what do you do so you don't get sick in the first place? Really get into that preventative health. Um, so I started to explore a number of you know opportunities in terms of improving health. and. They were largely subjective at the time. And I came across, um, you know, a, 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 an individual, a brilliant scientist by the name of Dr. Mansur Muhammad, who had built this incredible approach to genetics that I had never, ever heard of before. So I was familiar with 23andMe and, you know, the consumer testing realm, right. and of course, the diagnostic testing realm, which was used in hospitals. But what Dr. Mansur had done and... The approach that he had was that functional medicine space that kind of sits right in the middle. So it's really about here are the variations in your genes, and these are important genes, and they predispose you to certain health concerns, conditions, and expectations. Um, so now that you understand that as sort of your objective guiding light, mm -hmm. what is it that you can do about it rather than taking something, throwing it against the wall, well, let's see what fits. Right? And that's, that's what we find the approach is, you know, when people start to improve their health journey, the first thing they do is go and, you know, Dr. Google and Dr. YouTube, and they <laughs> just type in like best diets 2021, and uh, I'll just follow the first diet that they provide. And they're really throwing things against the wall and hoping something sticks. And what we strongly recommend is you need an objective starting point. So when I mean objective, means something that's free of bias, something that's innate to you and unique to you because you're an individual. And once you find that starting point and what could be a better starting point than the genes in your DNA, now you're a lot more prepared and knowledgeable. You're intelligent about you. And in often cases, you'll see most of us have an intuition about what it is. You know, I don't like cardiovascular exercise. I hate running. And I learned later in my genes that I'm actually predisposed to lifting weights close to running. Right. Sometimes your body has that intuition. You just simply need that understanding of why. Like, why is it that I'm that way? Once you get that, now you can build a much more personalized and precision-based approach, and you're going to see those results faster while mitigating the consequences of doing something that you thought was healthy, but actually ended up harming you, you know, in your long-term health and wellness. Right. Or at least it's not optimal. Like, you could uh, do too much high-intensity workouts and not enough low-intensity mm -hmm. or vice versa, depending on your genes and, yeah. as you say, the predispositions yeah. that your body is set to. So what would be some of the prescriptions or, or recommendations that might come out of uh, a DNA company uh, test? Yeah, so what, we, what we're in the business of is, number one, we want to provide you with information, but we don't want to burden you. And a lot of people feel overwhelmed and burdened. You know, there's always this general anxiety when I do my DNA test. Like, is it going to tell me that I'm going to, you know, APOE and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, at risk of Alzheimer's and I have all these cardiovascular health concerns. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to overburden you. We simply want to give you awareness, mm -hmm. knowledge, and then the action of like, what is the physical things that I can do to help improve my gene expression or improve my outcomes, right? So when you receive our reports, we provide you with your health, kind of your health map, 
right? Your unique personalized health map. And then we're going to give you the recommendations from lifestyle, diet, nutrition, environment, exercise, the fun, the actual tangible insights that you can use to start improving your health and wellness. And best of all, we don't even kind of just leave you on your own. We actually provide personalized behavioral change coaching programs to walk you through, hey, how do I, you know, when you first learn about your health, the top things people tell you, reduce your stress, eat well, work out more, sleep better. Well, those are really difficult things to do if you think about it. Like you're asking about, you know, for me to change my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's level 10 of what I need to do. How do I start from level zero and work myself right. up to level 10? Um, so we provide that hand-holding behavioral change to get you there using the functional genomics as your guide. That's awesome. I, I, I know BJ Fogg is yes. one of the uh, uh, just key figures in yeah. that space of figuring out what works and doesn't work in terms of uh, creating new habits and having them stick. And I, I know in his Tiny Habits book, he right. teaches how to start with, let's say, flossing one tooth. If you want a new habit of flossing your teeth, just get to one tooth. And then if you want to continue, feel free to do that. So what would be an example of that in, let's say, uh, changing your diet? Yeah. So, you know, a simple thing that we see often is, you know, certain individuals have an actual necessity to consume higher levels of vitamin C. Let's say, for example, it's a very simple uh, concept, but they struggle with it. And they, you know, they, they're already attuned to the idea that, well, we're not going to drink orange juice in the morning because it's way too, nobody can actually consume the amount of oranges that are in a glass mm -hmm. of orange juice on a daily basis. But still, I need to figure out a way where I can consume citrus. So one of the things we had recommended, one of our coaches recommends, hey, level zero is... Every night before you go to bed, I want you to take an orange with you and put it on your bedside table. So when you wake up, the first thing in the morning when you reach for your phone, you're going to touch that orange. It's a reminder. And I want you to become used to that for the next week to 10 days. Mm -hmm. So you get used to seeing an orange there. And then we're going to take the level one. And level one is have that orange cut at night. So when you wake up, it's ready for you to eat. Right. And that's how we're building that. So you get to that. So really, you know what? I'm used to eating an orange every morning. How do I get that? That's my citrus management. Right. And so we start something very, very simple and easy, and we know it's a process that you have to work on. It's not going to happen overnight. So we're there with you to hold your hands and get you where you need to get. Awesome. Well, let's take sleep as another example. I get enough deep sleep according to my aura ring, but I don't get enough REM sleep. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, wake up a number of times uh, during the night, even though I don't realize it. Mm -hmm. So what would a, uh, the DNA companies test show me about my sleep and how to improve that. And then what sort of behavior changes mm -hmm. would uh, your coaches walk me through? So sure, that sure. So, that? you know, I always say that if I, if I could have people fix one thing right away, it's got to be their sleep. I mean, it's right. the most abused longevity tool that we as humans possess. And it's absolutely free, by the way. Like, there's no cost to sleeping well. Um, but we know that there are genetic predispositions that can influence your ability to achieve that REM sleep. So the most important ones that we know, for example, the clock genes. We know that the clock genes influence circadian rhythms in your sleep-wake cycle. On top of that, uh, your BDNF gene. So BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is the factor that's responsible, amongst many other things, to help you regulate your sleep and wake cycles. And when individuals produce lower levels of BDNF, even if they are getting their seven to eight hours of sleep, they actually have a much tougher time achieving those REM sleep cycles. Um, and there are a number of factors influencing that people don't realize, you know, they always say, well, I need a supplement for sleep. And I always tell them, no supplement, no drug I can give you is going to help you fall asleep like this if you're staying up at night using your digital screens before you go to bed. Right. If you're on your phone laying in the, in the dark using those phones, you could take as much magnesium and as much supplements as you want. It's still going to take you time to fall asleep. And particularly if you hold a BDNF gene, the low version, the variation that predisposes you towards low BDNF. So a behavioral change expert would help you understand the importance of this. That Listen, at a genetic level, you're not producing levels of BDNF like you should. So the first thing we're going to do is, well, how do we improve BDNF levels? And people think that, well, I got to improve them at night. No, absolutely not. In fact, in order to get the sleep you want, you've got to improve your BDNF levels at the start of the day so that they're high enough throughout the day to get you ready for bed at night. So what does that mean? Well, what are the, one, the most important things to improve BDNF? Exercise or the use of a sauna or simply going outside. So in this beautiful, sunny environment here in Miami, 
you have an opportunity to get outside, but anywhere you are, if you exercise during the day, it's clinically studied to improve levels of BDNF. The second thing we have to do is stress the importance of detoxing from digital screens at night. Really, it's a really tough thing to do. I get it. Everyone's working using phones, but understanding that that's actually influencing your ability to fall asleep can sometimes trigger something in people, right? So what do we do to help you get there? Is it a alarm or an app that says, well, after 10 p.m. at night, you cannot use this phone, right? You lock it in and you give the, the password to someone else, depending on how addicted you are to the screen. So we would walk you through that. We'd ask you, how addicted are you to your phones? Are you like scrolling Instagram at night? Or can you detox yourself? And then we would work with you to help develop those habits so that you stop using your phones at night so you can get to bed. <laughs> awesome. So what would be some of your uh, sleep routines to mm -hmm. get uh, into a you know, good parasympathetic state yeah. and wind down and you know, no blue light exposure, all that sort of stuff, chill the room? What, what are your... Yeah, yeah. Sleep hygiene. Things? Sleep hygiene is exceptionally important, right? So temperature... Make sure the room temperature is, is the appropriate temperature. You should be a little bit cold enough to like actually wear your blanket, you know, put on your blanket. You don't want it to be too hot or too cold. Second thing you want to ensure is the smell of the room, like a room, like an actual, you know, what's the aromatic experience when you go to this room? Sometimes people have found benefits in using essential oils, lavender, whatever is to help relax the system. But I would say more important than that is people often say, you know what, well, I get eight hours of sleep but I don't feel rested. I was like, well, what time do you go to bed? 1.30, 2 o'clock at night. I was like, that's not gonna help you, right? Because you have to understand, certain processes in your body that are designed to detoxify your body, glutathionization, um, you know, antioxidation, methylation, so these factors, these processes are actually most active when you're in REM sleep. That's when it's resting and recovering. Yeah. So if you're falling asleep at 2 a.m. at night, you may not actually be activating your glutathionization until 4.30 in the morning. Right. And then if you got to wake up at like 8 or 9 a.m., you actually haven't given your body enough time to complete those processes. So I always say and, you know, one of our one of my mentors always told me this. And it's such an important thing. An hour of sleep before midnight is worth two hours of sleep after midnight. So it's really shifting when you sleep. That's mm -hmm. extremely important. And I know in our life it gets busy. Right. So especially if you've got kids and stuff, well, you don't actually start your day till like 9 or 10 p.m. at night, and then you're like, oh, I want to watch TV. And there's there's even things now as uh, revenge sleep procrastination. Like you feel like you haven't done enough relaxing and sleep is the only thing you can sacrifice because you're so busy, right? This, this, this yeah. idea of being super busy. So we always stress, try as hard as you can to go to bed at 10 to 11 p.m. at night, at, like at the latest, right? You really want to get to bed earlier before 12. Um, and how do you do it? Like I said, you can build in the apps to not use the phone. You can turn off the phone into airplane mode and read a book, right? Mm -hmm. Help yourself get into that parasympathetic state, that beta level uh, experience. Sit in bed, turn on some low light, read a book and kind of just relax your mind. Deep breathing exercises are super effective as well. So for every person, it's going to be different. And that's why we work with them to find out what works better for them. Yeah. Do you have... a uh red lights in your in your room to personally i don't uh i'm the kind of person and this is again genetically you know i'm predisposed to this i'm like go 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 till i'm zero percent battery right <laughs> so when i hit the bed i'm out within like two minutes i don't have a problem my wife for example on the other hand she has low levels of bdnf she's like i cannot go to bed until i read for half an hour so we have to structure our schedules like you go to bed half an hour early so by the time i get to bed we can fall asleep within minutes, right? So for me personally, it's it's simply the way I'm designed. I work till I'm zero percent function. I hit the bed, I sleep, but I do sleep early at night, and I do get my seven and a half hours of sleep. So I'm up in the morning and good to go. That's cool. Is there anything that would be a, a counterintuitive or unconventional hack for sleep that our uh, our viewer might be interested to hear? Uh, yeah. So. You know, I don't know how many of our viewers engage in, in compound exercises, weightlifting, but what we have found is actually deadlifting, the actual deadlift exercise. If you conduct that uh, at the right time, so it's usually between 5 to 7 p.m. for males because of the high levels of testosterone. Females can do it as well, but really for males. If you conduct heavy deadlift exercises, you will have absolutely no problem falling asleep at night. It's simply... It's, it's such an impact, a physical impact. The body's like, I need to rest. It's a fantastic workout. Mm. And I strongly recommend that you work with a personal trainer to learn how to effectively deadlift. But deadlifting is one thing I've found that if you need to fall asleep, and if I can't fall asleep because I'm traveling, just do a, you know three, four sets of deadlifts, and I'm out like a night. Like, I'm out like a bug at night. It's crazy. Yeah. 
yeah, so that's my that's my recommendation. <laughs> Well, that means you have to have the, the weights uh, nearby. Yeah, if you've got a gym membership or wherever it is, you can. And it doesn't even have to be something uh, extremely heavy, right? You could use a kettlebell or you could even practice the deadlift without the weights. But simply getting into that, that motion, that, that can help, you know, help stimulate well, the production of BDF, but also stimulate your body to get ready for battle. All right. What's your, uh, your thoughts on um, melatonin as a supplement? Yeah, I always say, you know, melatonin is a, uh, it's a band-aid. If you're not producing enough melatonin and you're taking melatonin, you're putting a band-aid on your sleep problem. You got to figure out, well, what's causing my low melatonin levels? Mm -hmm. Is it that I'm taking vitamin D at the wrong time? Is it that I'm stressed out and I'm not producing enough? What is the root cause of not producing enough melatonin? Sure, you can take melatonin at night and you fall asleep that day. But that's not going to fix your sleep cycles. If you can address the root cause, you may actually never end up having to take melatonin at all because your body's now producing the amount of melatonin you need and you're ready to go to bed. Well, it's like vitamin D. You really should be getting enough sunlight uh, mm -hmm. across enough uh, surface area of your body and your skin that you don't have to take it as a supplement. Yep. Most yep. people are not mad. Well, not only they're not doing it, they're also taking it after 3 or 4 p.m. In the, in the afternoon. And think about it. Vitamin D... Biologically, our body responds to vitamin D by saying, hey, I must be out in the sun, right? So if my vitamin D is being taken at 4, 5, 6 p.m. in the evening, my body's like, oh, I guess, I guess there's sunlight. And so it's going to actually reduce the production of melatonin because like, oh, it must be sunlight right now because I've got vitamin D influx in my body. So people don't realize that. So we always say, you know, take your vitamin D early in the morning, right, to manage your, 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 uh, your circadian rhythms. And if you have to take it again in the afternoon, don't take it after 3 p.m. because you're going to shift your circadian rhythm cycles right away. Right. So no snacking on those vitamin D gummies. All yeah. Well, yeah, especially. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's for another reason you shouldn't be eating sugar at night. But absolutely. You don't look vitamin D is toxic. Right. So you have to understand that, too. You don't want to overburden your body with vitamin D. You have to be intelligent with how you take it. It's an extremely important. It's probably one of the most important supplements out there. If you take it effectively, it can change so much. But that's the point. You've got to be intelligent with the way you approach vitamin D supplementation. Right, and uh, it's been implicated as one of the key factors in uh, COVID-19 resiliency. Mm -hmm. If your vitamin D levels are in the dirt, your chance of mortality is much increased. Yeah, and if you look at why, you understand, well, vitamin D, it's not, it's not even a vitamin. It's a hormone, right? It's one of the most important hormones in your body. And the vitamin D receptor transcriptome is the major anti-inflammatory transcriptome in the body. It actually activates the inflammatory response. And so what we are seeing clinically, time after time, publication after publication, is people are taking healthy doses of absorbable vitamin D and reducing the risk of hospitalizations because they're having less cytokine storms. They're having less strong anti-inflammatory responses in their body. So absolutely, it's, it's, it's an extremely effective measure against hospitalization. Yeah, and yet not everyone is really good at absorbing the vitamin D supplements that they're mm -hmm. taking. So mm -hmm. they might take a whole lot, mm -hmm. uh, and let's say it's a good seven thousand I use a day, mm -hmm. but none of it or very little of it's getting um, incorporated into their into their biology. Mm -hmm. And there's a genetic component to that, right? Yeah, absolutely, exactly. And thank you for bringing that up. You know, when we look at vitamin D, there's a three step process. Number one is the activation. Right? So the vitamin D we absorb from the sun and that we get from vegetarian sources is known as herbocalciferol, it's vitamin D2. Well, the body needs to convert that into a usable form, vitamin D3, which is also known as cold calciferol. Now, if you're a vegan or you're plant-based, you're not going to take cold calciferol because it's made from lanolin. Sheep's wool is usually where it's derived from, and so you're going to try to source that herbocalciferol. But there's an actual gene in your body whose job it is to convert D2 to D3. And if you're from, or if your ancestry is from the equatorial regions of mm -hmm. the world, your ancestors were exposed to vitamin D for, you know, 16 hours a day, 365 days a year. So your genes were naturally slowed because you didn't want to toxi toxify yourself with vitamin D. Now, if you pick that person up and you bring them to Toronto, where I'm from, and my background is, you know, from Pakistan, I'm definitely going to be chronically low in vitamin D. I'm simply not taking, so I actually have to take a higher dose than most people of the vitamin D. Well, that's just step one. Then after it's activated, it has to actually be transported to the site of action, right? It doesn't just activate where it doesn't cause its action where it is. 
So there's a gene that actually transports the vitamin D bus, I like to call it. It's called the, uh, the vitamin D binding protein. And the gene that's responsible for producing that protein can be suboptimal. And if it's suboptimal, it's very easy as this. Let's say you've got 5,000 people who are trying to get on a bus, but the bus only has space for 2,500. Well, what's going to happen? 2,500 of them are going to go where they need to go. But the other 2,500 are going to get stored in your adipose tissue because vitamin D is fat soluble. It doesn't get peed out. It's not water soluble. So and then it's going to build your vitamin D toxicity, right? So we always tell people, listen, it's probably more effective for you to split that vitamin D dose and then take it at the right time. Take it in the morning and take it during lunch. And that's going to be a lot more effective in you utilizing the vitamin D than just taking 10,000 IU in the morning or heavens forbid you're taking it in the evening because you forgot to take it. Right, right. And uh, switching to another vitamin that your genes can determine whether you're able to absorb it or not in, in the form that you're taking it is uh, vitamin B12 and then the uh, MTHFR mm -hmm. uh, gene has an uh, implication on whether you need methyl B12 in order to uh, fully utilize the mm -hmm. vitamin B. So what do you say? Yeah, so, um, so the methylation cycle, right, is, is, is essentially, when we talk methylation, we're talking about anti-inflammation. It's the easiest way to understand it. How does your body respond to the presence of toxins by producing methyl groups, which help metabolize toxins or prepare them from excretion? So MTHFR is part of a cascade of genes, number of genes that work together to produce those methyl groups that you need. And MTHFR's function is to methylate um, folate, vitamin B9, uh, as a cofactor. You know, there's other genes that are involved in that process. So when I see I've got someone with low MTHFR, I don't just want to dose them with pre-methylated vitamins because you're not even understanding what that entire cascade looks like. And you mm -hmm. certainly don't want to over-methylate yourself and give yourself too many methyl groups because that can start causing unwanted gene expression, right? So the source, the version, and the dosing is extremely important when it comes to methylate, methylated products. We normally recommend using... Um, vitamin uh, B9 in the adenosyl or folinic form. So folinic acid or adenosyl folate, because what that folate allows your body to do is use the amount of folate necessary to methylate in the first place. If you pre-methylate the folate, well, the body's got no choice. It has to use that methylated folate and remove those methyl groups, right? Um, same thing with vitamin B12 for MTR and MTRR function. Not everyone needs methylated B12. In fact, the more effective B12 product is adenosyl B12, adenosyl cobalamin, because again, you're allowing the body to predetermine, based on its function, how much of this vitamin do you need to be methylated in the first place. Yeah, awesome. So looking across all the different things that you could do to uh, increase your longevity, improving your sleep, uh, taking all the right supplements mm -hmm. and all the right amounts and the right times of day, uh, changing your diet, exercise regimen, all this sort of stuff, what would you say is the most important area that needs to be addressed? And then what would be the area or a, a particular aspect that you guys cover in the, in the test done by the DNA company mm -hmm. that give insight that otherwise they wouldn't have received? Right, right. And it's, a, you know, it's such an important question. Like everything in life, longevity is not a siloed approach. It's not like, well, I got to do this one thing. Like I just got to zone in and fix my diet. It has to be a multidisciplinary, multifactorial approach. Mm -hmm. What we believe is the aspect of longevity that most people aren't actually paying attention to is this thing right here. It's mm -hmm. the longevity of the brain. I'll tell you something. The majority of people who live very long lives their physical health and capacity leaves them early in life. By the time you're 70 or 80 years old, even if you're super healthy, you've lost a lot of your muscle strength and your muscle capabilities. But what you haven't lost in these super healthy biohackers is their, their mental sharpness, right? And concurrently, you'll find that people who didn't take care of their health, their mental health, even if they were super, super healthy physically, they see a much more rapid decline as they get older because they simply didn't give that brain, that organ that's so important, the respect it needs. So what we really try to teach people is mental longevity is a often ignored, but extremely crucial part of achieving, mm -hmm. you know, overall longevity. And we really want to stress that. So what we do from a mood and behavioral perspective is show you insights into how genes 
influence your relationship with neurotransmitters like dopamine, like noradrenaline, like serotonin, like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. When you understand how you're positioned to respond to stressors in life, you can develop a personalized approach to it, right? Some people stress over like an exam, right? Other people are like, I'm going to study one day, I'm going to write it. But that stress over that exam can strongly affect your longevity. That stress that you're putting on your body at a physical level, at a mental level, is going to reduce your longevity because you're simply not ready to handle that kind of pressure. So we really stress that and we teach people how to approach the improvement of their mental health through a personalized manner. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Harris. My and pleasure. Uh, for you, you watching, uh, check out the Biohacking Congress. The next one is in Las Vegas on March 19th and 20th. Go to biohackingcongress.com to register and hope to see you there. Thanks, guys. Thank you.